So let's uh, let's start today's uh, uh, session. I'm uh, very, really, very happy to introduce uh, Professor and welcome at ULB, Professor Ricardo Viguesa. He's an associate professor of, in, uh, at the Department of Engineering, Mechanics at the KTH Royal Institute <coughs> of uh, Technology in Stockholm. He's also a researcher. Uh, uh, at the K KTH Climate Action Center and Vice Director of the KTH Digitalization Platform. Uh, Ricardo is a, uh, it's a graduate of uh, the University of Valencia, Polytechnic School of Valencia, and uh, he has received a PhD in aerospace uh, and mechanical engineering from the Institute of Technology in Chicago. Um, he has, uh, uh, is very well known in the uh, fluid dynamic community and now in the uh, AI and machine learning community uh, for his work on uh, turbulent flows, <coughs> uh, boundary layers, and urban environments. Uh, today, uh, we talk about uh, AI and uh, uh, you see it in, on the slide. So the, the role of AI in uh, achieving these uh, sustainable development <coughs> goals, I would like to stress that uh, Recently, he received uh, one of the most uh, uh, important uh, scholarship that is uh, awarded by the European Commission, which is the uh, advanced, uh, sorry, a consolidator grant, uh, ERC consolidator grant. And so these are individual uh, scholarship that are uh, provided and are, that belong to this excellent science track of the European Commission for his work, for his seminal work on, on uh, machine learning and uh, turbines. Uh, modeling. <coughs> so thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be, to be here. So I'm going to speak about my work on AI and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, my, fund, my research is funded, by, among others, by the Sweden Sea Science Research Center and the European Research uh, Council. So what I want to do is uh, I will divide the talk into two parts. First, I'm going to talk generally about how AI can help sustainability in very various areas, globally in different examples. And then I give you some uh, concrete uh, AI applications. I will not to go, uh, go too much into the details of the AI, <coughs> but I will kind of highlight how it can help in, in concrete examples within the, the sustainable development goals. So let's start with the first part. Eh? How can AI help uh, sustainability generally? And uh, as, as you know, right, the Sustainable Development Goals are uh, basically the, the blueprint of the, of the UN, of the United Nations, towards a sustainable agenda uh, for 2030. And they span a very wide range of areas, right? So you have from uh, no poverty and uh, no hunger uh, towards uh, strong institutions and peace uh, worldwide, right? So it's a quite uh, broad um, agenda. And therefore, to be able to analyze it, one needs a quite complete uh, research team uh, that can span all the possible uh, areas. And as you know, <coughs> the SDGs have uh, 17 goals, which are the big goals, and then smaller targets, no? like sub-goals. <coughs> so there are a total of 169 targets, the small goals, and 17 uh, big goals, which are the, the SDGs. So what we wanted to do was to answer the question of whether uh, there is published evidence on, on what uh, AI can do positively, but also negatively, to achieve each of the 169 targets of the SDGs. And to do that, we uh, assemble a multidisciplinary team, uh, so we could really tackle all these areas and have a quite uh, thorough discussion. This is what we call an expert elicitation process, so we can actually have different perspectives and analyze uh, complementary views in this uh, sort of analysis. Uh, everything that I'm going to be showing here is in this article in Nature Communications. This was published two years ago, so I will give some highlights on some of the main areas and some of the main examples Samples, but uh, in this article you have a list where for each of the 169 targets we give you 5 to 10 references on our argumentation for positive and negative effects. So I, I recommend you that you go into the supplementary material here and that you have a look at it because I think it's, I mean, now it's uh, two years old and of course AI changes very, very quickly. Unfortunately, the climate situation also changes quite quickly, uh, but it should be reasonably up to date. And then of course there are new uh, references that you can consult, but it's a good starting point. If you're interested in this topic and these areas, go to this article, it's open access, get to the supplementary material and check out the the list there. And of course, I'm always happy to answer questions and discuss. So this is the team. 
Uh, as you can see, it's quite complete. It, was, uh, it spanned almost all the continents worldwide. We had experts in machine learning, uh, in engineering, experts in fundamental machine learning and theoretical machine learning, but also experts in interaction design and ethics, uh, economy, biodiversity, uh, sustainability, energy systems, uh, and also experts in applied AI and people like Max Tiekmark from MIT, who is very well known for his work on the future of our world and the future of AI. So we had a quite complete a range of, um, of areas of expertise, so we could really have a complementary view on this. And the first thing that we did was to divide the 17 uh, SDGs into three categories, so we could look uh, holistically at all the various areas. So we looked at uh, the society, the economy, and the environment. Uh, this, uh, this is a quite a standard classification. So, for example, the Stockholm Resilience Center has used it before. So, uh, I mean, there is some uh, possible variations on some of these SDGs that could be in the society or in the economy, uh, but this is more or less the, the most standard way of, of doing it. <clears throat> so, the reason to do this is that we, this way we could actually see globally in these three areas how AI can impact positively and negatively. Okay? Uh, and this is the process, okay? This is how the supplementary material that I was telling you before about, uh, this is how it looks like. So this is a big Excel, and this is hundreds of rows. Uh, for each of the, so here on the top we have the SDG, this is SDG 1. Uh, what we did is that we assign for each of the SDGs one or more, um, basically, evaluators, responsible people. Uh, who and the job of these people was to make a first assessment. No? And what we would do is that we would go target by target. This is 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Here is the formulation of the target, our reasoning and the references. Uh, the green column uh, Im implies that there is a positive effect of AI on that particular target and the orange one that there is a negative effect of AI on that particular target. Uh, this uh, blue here means that there is no evidence, right? So, for example, on target 1.2, we have a positive effect of AI, but no negative effect, in principle, right? based on our survey. So, <clears throat> we assigned several people, one, two, or three, who were the responsible people of this um, SDG. So, in this case, uh, we had uh, Sami and Simone, these two people on the top, those were responsible. And then we assigned several reviewers as well. No? And in this case, it was Yolanda and myself, who would review the work of this SDG. And the process is that these two people would make a first assessment and then the reviewers would independently look at it and assess uh, from a different perspective because the reviewers uh, had areas of knowledge that were complementary to those of the experts. So the experts would be in principle um, very experienced in the topic of the SDG and the reviewers would have complementary skills. Uh, so we had what is called a, um, an expert elicitation, so we had a discussion. So we would uh, try to bring in new perspectives, have you thought about this, have you thought about this negative part. Typically the experts would focus on the positives because they know the topic better and the reviewers would bring in the negatives because you try to look at it with different eyes, with fresh eyes. And then we had a um, a discussion uh, so that we could converge uh, towards a set of references and a set of uh, reasoning uh, arguments uh, that we would all agree on, basically. So working like this, we produce this long list. Uh, so for again, for all of the targets, positive and negative effects of AI. And um, what we concluded was the following, and this is the, the big summary of the, of the study. So we found that 79% of the targets, not the SDG, but the targets, the smaller goals, can be positively affected by the development of artificial intelligence. And by artificial intelligence, um, I mean, we have a, a more concrete definition in the article, uh, but we don't mean digitalization in general. So we actually are talking about uh, algorithms that can uh, help us make uh, predictions uh, with a certain uh, set of, of limitations. Um, and this is, uh, depending on the field that you look at, the definition of artificial intelligence is a bit different. So we try to take a quite general definition here that would encompass all the areas, uh, but generally uh, algorithms that help us to make predictions from data, so data-driven methods, uh, but not generally digitalization. Uh, that's kind of like the, the important thing. So 79% <clears throat> of the targets can be positively affected by AI, which is in principle good and shows quite some promise. 35% of them can uh, see their achievement uh, inhibited by the development of artificial intelligence. Uh, and in principle, this is a good message, and this is something to be positive about, uh, but we should realize that these negatives, even if they are uh, you know, fewer yeah, in quantity, uh, they can be critical, uh, because uh, it's enough to take one uh, SDG with very negative consequences 
to, in a way, destroy all the positive uh, progress, right? So, so it's not, uh, we cannot look at this like, uh, okay, there is more positive than negative, so let's do AI without any control. No, it's not like that, right? Because uh, the negatives can be quite important. Uh, so this is something to be, and I will emphasize this a bit more later when I talk about policy and uh, about the implications on the regulations, but uh, for now, we have overall a positive effect. And if we look at the three areas, environment, economy, and society, what we see is that the environment has a, probably the, the most positive uh, effect of AI. So 93% of all the targets can be uh, positively affected by the AI within the environment, which is an interesting conclusion uh, because AI can have also negative effects on the environment. Um, and then the one with most uh, threats associated with AI would probably be the society. So 38% of the targets within the society can be negatively affected by AI. And I think that we have actually experienced that quite a bit now with the, with the COVID situation, uh, with some election results and things like that. So, so I think that it's also quite clear that there are some pitfalls that need to be assessed and need to be uh, evaluated. Okay? So these are the big picture results. Uh, what we can do now is that we can go to each of the SDGs. So what I'm showing you on the left is uh, for each of the SDGs the percentage of targets that can be positively affected by AI, and on the right, the percentage of targets for each SDG that can be negatively affected by AI. Okay? So uh, here and here, these are uh, classified in terms of the society, the economy, and the environment. So you can see this wheel no, with all the, all the individual um, SDGs. Uh, there are two, um, there are two lines, no? the, the lighter green and the lighter uh, and the darker green, and the lighter orange and the darker one. Um, the lighter color represents the results when there is uh, at least one reference pointing to positive or negative effects. And that reference, uh, we don't really take into account how strong the evidence is. Eh? So any reference that suggests a positive or a negative effect. Okay? And here, of course, what we can see is that the green area is much bigger than the orange area, which uh, basically signifies that we have much po more positive effects, 79%, than negative effect, which is 35%. Okay? So far, so good? So what we can do now also, because there is a darker color, so there is an additional analysis, what we can also do is uh, keep in mind that not all the references are the same, right? So what we did was to, uh, and by the way, we looked at references uh, mostly based on scientific articles, but also we looked at uh, technical reports from large co companies like IBM and Apple, things like that. So we tried to look at some applications as well, uh, but this uh, work is more heavily based on scientific evidence, right? so scientific works. Uh, we are now working on extensions more uh, focused on, on projects, uh, actual projects, but we thought that for this first assessment it was safer to, to stick to, to scientific uh, uh, evidence. So, those, uh, uh, those uh, references that we took in our analysis were divided into four categories uh, based on how strong the evidence was. So the I type of, uh, type of reference were the, most, uh, the ones that were easiest to generalize, the ones based on most robust methods and analysis and uh, on best data, basically. And these ones have a weighting factor of one. Then we go down to B, C, and D type of references where the uh, weighting factor goes down, no? 0 0.75, 0 0.5, and 0 0.25, uh, in such a way that the uh, D type of references are the most speculative and the ones that are hardest to generalize. Uh, so in our view are the ones that uh, have uh, uh, the, the least uh, strong support towards the claim that they were having in the, in the paper. So these numbers in red, these weighting factors, what they do is basically uh, take into account that, uh, modulate that uh, influence of the strength of the evidence. So if one target was negatively affected by a C type of reference, then we would only count half of that target as being negatively affected. Okay, makes sense? So of course, when we do it, we go back to the previous slide, uh, then when we take into account these weighting factors, we get the areas in dark color, and the dark green and the dark uh, orange. So this is just a very easy you know, uh, multiplication uh, of weighting, this is a weighted average, basically. Uh, what we're having uh, is the numbers in brackets that you see for each of the SDGs, that's the number taking into account the weighting factors, uh, and the number without brackets is the, is the the magnitude without taking this into account. Uh, therefore, the dark area is going to be smaller or equal than the uh, light area uh, because of how these weighting factors are defined. 
Uh, and what that means is that um, this can be a good tool to identify research gaps, right? Because uh, if there is a big discrepancy between the, um, the light color and the dark color, that means that that's an area where there is some research, but it's not fundamental enough or it's not um, robust enough, essentially. And what is quite interesting <clears throat> is that um, if you look at the positives, so the plot on the left, the wheel on the left, the environment and the society see almost no reduction when I take into account the strength of the evidence. So the light and the dark colors are very close to each other. Um, however, if you look at the economy, there is quite a significant reduction between the light and the, and the dark color. What that means is that the strength of the evidence suggesting a positive effects of AI on the economy is weaker, right? So there is quite some studies, there is quite some work that AI is going to help us be more productive and so on, but that's a little bit more speculative. That's perhaps not the strongest evidence. And on the other hand, if we look at the negative effects, what we see is that in the economy, there is a reduction, but it's not so pronounced. And if we look at the environment and the society, the reduction is dramatic, right? It's drastic. So, uh, the negative effects of AI on the environment and the society are quite well documented. Uh, sorry, are not so well documented, but the negative effects on the economy are much more well documented. So the research gaps that we can identify are the positive effect of AI on the economy and the negative effects of AI on the environment and the society. So that's a little bit the areas where we should emphasize more. And of course, us as experts uh, have our own biases, which we try to you know, take into account by having complementary areas of knowledge, but still, uh, you know, we are still human. And one of the things that we are doing now is do this with machine learning. So that's one project that we are starting now where we are analyzing using natural language processing all the documents, all the data, and do these classifications uh, automatically so that we can try to take into account uh, those biases. But that's, of course, uh, ongoing work. So maybe next time I will tell you about this, maybe. But, uh, and that's a ch quite challenging project. Uh, that's not so, so easy to do with machine learning. But uh, in this first assessment, uh, where there is some human bias in there, uh, this is more or less the, the, the overall picture that you can, that you can get. Now, let me show you some examples. And again, here, you know, these are hundreds and hundreds of uh, rows in this Excel. So you can go and check out everything yourselves. But uh, some highlights that can be giving me some trends. Uh, overall, when we have positive effects of AI, it is typically because a new technology uh, is uh, enabled by, by this uh, type of data-driven methods. No? So suddenly, we can do now something that we couldn't do before. And one example is, for example, in, in SDG1, or no poverty, where it's possible to use satellite data and analyze it with uh, convolutional neural networks to be able to track areas of poverty. Yeah? So that's one area where it's quite some, uh, there is quite some potential uh, to be able to identify these areas of poverty using just satellite data. Uh, generally, the negative effects of AI come uh, usually because you increase inequalities, right? Either you have an impact on the environment, but more importantly, when you increase inequalities. Because, of course, if the future is going to rely on data and data-driven methods and high-performance computing, <coughs> and not everybody has the same access to this technology, then we're going to exacerbate the existing inequalities, uh, which will have a very negative impact on SDG 10, right, on reducing inequalities. So <coughs> this is a little bit the, the dichotomy that you have with AI technology. It's a double-edged sword, and we need to be uh, aware of these, um, of these uh, limitations. Okay, so uh, if we go a bit more into specifics, what I'm showing you here is uh, for all the three um, areas, the society, the economy, and the environment, I'm showing you all the targets and the positives and the negatives. Yeah? So this is a summary of the table that I was telling you before. Some examples, if we look at the environment, turns out that, uh, I mean, uh, climate action will have mostly positive effects, but there are some negative effects of AI and some targets, and they are actually quite well connected with, uh, with clean energy, eh, with SDG 7 on clean energy. So if you think of the, I mean, AI for sustainability and how AI can help the SDGs and so on, but we should also look at the complementary perspective, which is the sustainability of AI itself, right? Because uh, uh, artificial intelligence, data-driven methods, they typically rely on massive amounts of data. Uh, it's kind of in the name. You need data to do data-driven methods. And what happens is that uh, you need massive amounts of um, energy consumption to, uh, to be able to run the, the high-performance computing centers to train these models. 
Uh, and of course, that has a huge electrical cost that uh, needs to be taken into account when you're developing these methods for sustainability, for sustainability applications. To give you an idea, ICT, so Information and Communication Technologies, nowadays account for around 1% of the total electricity worldwide, nowadays, but by 2030, so in very few years, it's expected that this will go up to 20% uh, of the total. So we're going to increase the electricity consumption dramatically uh, because of the usage of this, um, of this uh, technology. And of course, what we should be doing is be aware of the ways to train these AI models in a more sustainable and responsible way. Uh, I mean, some examples, and this is something that I'm very, I'm always very surprised that people using AI in large, large models in companies, maybe they don't know these things, right? But you can, when you're trying to model a, a certain system, which can be a physical system, if you know something about that system, you should embed that in the model, right? You should use the physics that you know, and if it's not a physical system, if it's a, a, a medical system, you should use the expert knowledge. Everything that you know about the system should be embedded in the model, because if you don't do it, first of all, the network will have to learn that, and that's going to give worse results. And, and furthermore, you're going to use more computational resources to learn something that you already know. So anything that you know about the system should be embedded in the model, number one. And number two, one should use transfer learning. And transfer learning is one, um, is one uh, technique that you can use to uh, exploit that has been, what has been learned in one situation, in one uh, type of um, scenario, to another one. So if you have learned a lot about how a certain population behaves and now you're going to model a slightly different population, then you should uh, transfer the learning from one case to the other one so you can uh, train more efficiently. So this is very important when you use AI models, uh, do it responsibly because there is always an environmental cost associated with it. The same happens with high performance computing. When we run very large simulations uh, on you know, hundreds of thousands of, super comp of, of computers together, uh, we always get a bill at the end and an environmental bill. We have to be aware of the CO2 equivalent of those computations that you have done, right? So this is very important. Also, because we know that AI can really help um, in these aspects. I mean, uh, there are many uh, research directions now on using AI to feed supply and demand of electricity, to be able to prioritize sources that are re re renewable and reliable. So there are many, many techniques that can be uh, benefited from AI, but of course, without forgetting the sustainability of AI itself. Okay? Uh, more examples, uh, we have seen that AI can lead to political polarization. That's something that we have unfortunately experienced uh, quite a bit uh, over the past years, and I think it's probably happening even more. No? Uh, it seems that we leave one crisis and we dive into the next one. But um, unfortunately, the algorithms associated with social media are not helping in this, right? And, and one should uh, be uh, aware of the important implications on SDG 10, on reducing inequalities, but also on strong institutions, because uh, in many cases, uh, well, social media is, is, is guilty for this. No? And, and now we will have to see what happens with uh, Elon, Elon Musk and Twitter. No? That will be another development that will be interesting, but to some extent a bit, uh, a bit unclear no? what will happen. So that's also something to keep in mind. And uh, overall, now we are in the process of uh, developing an AI Act no, at the European Union and having some, some regulations, what we should uh, prioritize is the uh, regulatory insight rather than the regulatory oversight. Right? So, so we should not regulate for the sake of regulating. We should have experts who are part of these processes, who are part of these uh, groups who can really, really contribute towards uh, the understanding of what AI can and cannot do so that the people who are responsible then for making the policy are uh, doing it in a, in a reliable manner and in a, in a reasonable manner. So this is quite important as well, and there are many initiatives, I mean, several EU initiatives to contribute towards this AI Act, but uh, still the role of experts should not be underemphasized. It's always, always uh, important to have people who know what this technology can do uh, in the process of uh, regulating the technology. Okay? Uh, so other examples that can uh, have a real impact in our lives uh, of data-driven methods. This is another study that, we, that, that is quite connected, and this is uh, in the context of the uh, digital contact tracing apps. Now, if you remember a couple of years ago, at the beginning of COVID, this became quite, uh, well, quite popular for good and bad reasons, these apps that would tell us if we were nearby someone who had COVID and so on. Um, this, of course, has very important implications on SDGs 3, on health, and SDG 10, on inequalities, right? I mean, we have to really 
make sure that these apps are developed in, a, in an ethical manner. And uh, we had a study, you can see it here in Results in Engineering 2020, where we tried to develop a socio-technical framework so these apps are uh, basically respecting uh, the individual's freedoms, uh, the freedom of the citizens, uh, in three different categories. No? When it comes to the impact on the citizens, when it comes to the technology, and when it comes to the governance, which is uh, quite often uh, not really considered and is a critical aspect, no? the governance. One of the main um, conclusions that we had uh, is that uh, the data gathering had to be decentralized, right? So all the data from the individuals cannot be in the same place. And to do that, the DP3T protocol, which was uh, developed at uh, ETH uh, and Lausanne, it was in, in, in Switzerland in 2020, uh, was quite, quite a good solution, uh, quite a good uh, uh, protocol to do this. Uh, and what we also did was to uh, compare uh, with our criteria, uh, with our um, framework for ethical assessment, we looked at three apps at the time and we compare also with the European Data Protection Board guidelines uh, and the figure is quite similar. This is another you know, web chart like, like before to see how well the various criteria of our framework were met essentially. And uh, what we could see, the Stop Corona, which was the Austrian app, was actually pretty good, 76%. Uh, Trace Together, which was the one in Singapore, uh, was quite good in impact on the citizens and, te and technology, but the governance was terrible. Uh, turns out that the government was sending SMSs all the time to the citizens, so you know, it, it was not the best way to uh, deploy this technological solution. And then we had, of course, the NHS from the UK. This was the initial version that they proposed uh, which was uh, a centralized approach, so they were having all the data at the same place, and of course this failed miserably, this was a terrible app, but it was changed. So later on they proposed a solution that was decentralized, so it was a bit better. Even the European, so this fourth uh, figure corresponds to the European guidelines, uh, and even the, the, basically the regulation, there was not really regulations, but the guidelines of the EU were not enough according to our criterion, so there were some limitations also there. So perhaps one of the big uh, take home messages is um, when you're trying to deploy a new technology in a crisis in the society, the governance is essential, and together with the governance you have the communication, right? And there were many, many, um, pitfalls, there were many uh, mistakes in the communication strategies of the governments, uh, and it was, this was part of the reason why these apps were not really uh, adopted, so they could not really help in the, significantly you know, in the spread of COVID. But my, my mm, belief is that uh, a better communication campaign and a better design of these apps could have actually helped. Yeah? So this is an example, and of course, these apps are going to be present in our lives for more areas, not only for COVID, but maybe for... Uh, carbon emissions, maybe for loans, things like that. So if this is going to be the case, one should make sure that things are done in a, in a reasonable way and in an ethically compliant uh, manner. Mm? So that's quite important. And uh, maybe to, to summarize a little bit the dynamics that I was showing you uh, regarding the, the impacts on the, um, on the technology, the governments and the citizens. So th this summarizes everything. No? We see that, uh, and in this figure, the thickness of the arrows uh, indicates the speed of change, right? So the thicker the arrow, the, fast, uh, the faster the changes. So we have technology, and technology is, of course, having a quite quick impact on the individuals eh, through new technological developments. The individuals are having new needs, and that's a bit slower than the technology, so the technology is really fast. The individuals are going a bit behind the technology, which is a bit unfortunate, but that's what it is. And then the governments are certainly very, very slow in reacting, right? I mean, the, the technology and the individuals need reaction from the governments in terms of new standards, new policy, and new regulation. And you see that these are the thinnest arrows that you have seen in your life, right? So these are very, very uh, slow uh, reaction of the governments towards the changes from individuals and technology. And all of this happens with the environment as an uh, underlying layer, right? So we have, of course, positive and negative impacts on the environment and resources that we extract from it. So this is a quite important dance that happens between all these agents. And uh, we have to be aware of how we can actually change this so that there is faster action from the governments and there is a more um, decisive uh, impact of the individuals in these uh, interactions that we have. Okay? So... Now what I'm going to do is that uh, from all the examples that I've shown you, uh, there is one that I believe is quite, uh, quite interesting and quite impactful, and is that of uh, SDG 11. No? SDG 11 has to do with sustainable cities and communities, uh, and that's one uh, area 
where uh, our study uh, found that all the targets uh, of SDG 11 can be positively affected. Uh, so that's a quite uh, promising direction for developing AI. And uh, one area where AI can really help is to uh, measure the air quality and the pollution in cities. No? And this is important because 800,000 people die every year in Europe only because of exposure to uh, pollution levels, to high pollution levels. So it's kind of a big deal, right? It's kind of important. And sometimes, uh, even if some politicians want to underplay the, the, the effect of pollution, this is there and this is a real problem. And uh, this happened to uh, influence some of my later work in the area of fluid mechanics. I started to dive into urban environments and cities because of the motivation that we had here from this uh, more sustainability-oriented um, study. So we can actually focus now on cities and on urban environments to really understand a bit more how things happen and how we can use AI to uh, have a much more um, sustainable urban uh, environment around us. So I'm not going to go too much into the details, but these are flow simulations, right? So what we are doing here, uh, here this is a, a model of a building, an obstacle. What I'm showing you is a very detailed simulation of the flow around it. So these are flow structures that are around that obstacle. And the main idea is to use uh, sensors, so these are these black uh, dots that you see here, sparse measurements to be able to reconstruct with neural networks, which is a type of artificial intelligence algorithm, uh, the flow around it. Uh, so we want to go from these black dots to the three-dimensional representation of the flow that you can see, that you can see there. And uh, this can be done in different ways. You can combine, you know, again, if reduce order models, physics, uh, there are some types of neural networks and I will tell you now some examples on how we can actually do it. But essentially, the idea is that you can uh, reconstruct from these sparse measurements either three-dimensional representations of the flow or some slices of the flow. And uh, here on the right, you can actually see that we can use computers to simulate this with quite some detail. So when you actually change the separation between the two obstacles, the flow regime changes quite a bit, and then we can actually try to understand a bit more. Uh, if you understand the flow, which means the velocity of the air in these uh, environments, then you can understand also better the temperature distributions, and you can actually get a bit some insight into the pollutant concentration, right? So that's a little bit what we want to do. We want to go from these sparse measurements to uh, representations of the pollutant and the um, conditions, uh, the health conditions that are present in the city. And before diving a bit more into this example, so, so the second part of the talk will be about using AI to predict uh, the flow in these you know, flow cases, these urban environments. And I will not get too technical, but I will want to give you an overview of how this works so that you don't only have a list of things. You can, you know, there's some positive potential, some negative potential, but I want to explain you exactly how that positive potential can be harnessed. No? Uh, before diving into that, Another aspect that I think is essential and is not always so well understood is that of uh, interpretability. No? So um, deep learning models, neural networks, are uh, essentially uh, black boxes. No? They are not interpretable. And what I mean with interpretability is um, the property of having a, a clear uh, representation of how the inputs and the outputs are connected. Okay? That's a bit of a general uh, situation. And there are other machine learning methods that are interpretable, eh? but they are usually not as accurate of, as neural networks, so we want to be able to have those neural networks in an interpretable manner. No? And the, one way to do it, uh, and we have some work from Kramer and others, we have some work also in nature machine intelligence, um, so one way to do it is to use um, inductive biases and to use symbolic regression, uh, so essentially we can get equations from the structure of the network. Right? And I'm going to give you one example. If you remember, uh, if we look at poverty, uh, SDG1, and how we can use uh, satellite uh, images and convolutional neural networks to analyze those images to predict poverty, uh, that I, that's an, an example that I gave you some, some minutes ago, usually what happens is that you have the satellite data that you can see here, and then the CNN, this convolutional neural network, is going to, uh, well, it's going to identify features in those images that uh, enable a prediction of the consumption per capita and per day. No? And that's going to give you a prediction of whether that region is going to be poor or not, essentially. Uh, but of course, the only thing that you have with a typical neural network is that uh, you have the images and you have the output. This image uh, indicates poverty. This image indicates no poverty, but you don't know why. I mean, okay, but wh why is it like that? Uh, 
what we want to do with interpretability is to have a symbolic equation like this one. So you can actually get from the neural network, from the deep learning model, an equation that connects, in this example, the uh, consumption per capita, the wealth of the country, of the area, based on, for example, the night li nightlife um, uh, light, the night uh, light in the, in the pictures, the amount of roads, the distance to city, many factors that are uh, implicitly in the neural network that is making the predictions, but that one cannot really access them and interpret them easily. Uh, with these approaches, we would end up with an equation, or several equations, that we can easily interpret uh, and that can give us much more insight than just a prediction, you know, a, a just a very abstract prediction where we don't know what is the impact of the various factors. And why is this important? Well, first of all, because uh, this type of equations uh, can help us learn the dynamics of a certain phenomenon. No? Uh, it's not only enough with knowing if a certain area is poor or not, maybe we want to learn whether this area will develop poverty eh, in uh, five years, in 10 years, because this equation will tell us a bit more of the dynamics. But the other thing that is important is that um, if you're using uh, deep learning solutions for uh, problems that are affecting our societies, then we need to know what those models are doing. We need transparency and we need accountability of the uh, officers who are deploying those solutions. So if you have a, a deep learning model that is going to predict whether you can get a loan or not, you know, that's a typical example, you want to see what happens in that algorithm and what are the values uh, that are important there and how you can contest the decision. So you want to always have a human where you can interact and discuss because not always uh, these uh, algorithms are very empathic, right? That's not their strongest suit. So it's important to be aware of this and to push for interpretable uh, alternatives or interpretable additions to these deep learning models that can help us provide reasonable uh, predictions. Okay? So now I will tell you a bit more about these examples. And if, if it gets too, I mean, I will not go too technical, but if it gets too technical, just, just let me know. Uh, the idea is that we, what we want to do if you remember from the picture before, is that we want to predict the flow at a certain distance from the wall, from the bottom. No? If you remember the building, we had the building here, we have some sensors here on the ground, right? and we want to predict what happens above that uh, level. Eh? Because that's what we call non-intrusive sensing, and that would mean, you know, in the context of a city, that from few sparse measurements in the city, you can reconstruct the three-dimensional volume, and therefore you can see what is actually happening in that, in that region. And this is not new, of course. I mean, uh, I mean my, in my main area of research, I'm a fluid mechanicist, a fluid dynamicist. So we, we have been doing this for quite some time. The problem is that people have been doing this uh, using linear methods, mostly. right? So they're connecting the measurements at the surface with what happens above using mostly linear methods. And of course, you can imagine, uh, if you intuitively, that this uh, flow is, is quite complicated uh, and is highly nonlinear uh, without getting into the equations. So these linear methods are not accurate enough and they're not general enough to be able to make that prediction. So they're quite flawed predictions usually if you use linear methods. And neural networks, one interesting property of them is that they can uh, enable nonlinear predictions, right? Because they have uh, well, these activation functions and these uh, properties uh, of concatenation of layers that allow us to uh, get much more general models and to make nonlinear predictions. Therefore, if you want to put this in a city and you want to make predictions, the neural networks are in principle a good um, solution because they can account for the nonlinearities that happen in these uh, environments, in these urban environments. So what we did, uh, we just started with a very simple example. So we don't have the building. Eh? What we have is just a wall and some, you know, some air coming on top of that wall. So we wanted to make sure that we could predict the air on top of that wall. And we generated a lot of uh, what is called training data. No? So we want to teach the network how the information at the wall is connected with information above the wall so the network can uh, learn those dependencies and then generalize to more uh, complicated flow cases later on. Uh, and what we did was to employ a particular type of neural network. The one that you see on the top is what we call a, a multi-layer perceptron. Uh, it's a network, a neural network, where each neuron of one layer is connected to all the neurons of the next one. And these networks, they are basically the, the, the most basic architecture that you can find. And um, they're not good, so good to analyze images. And of course, if you have a bunch of sensors, right, and you have a certain pattern in those sensors, what you want is to 
learn how they are connected in space, right? So you can make more accurate predictions. And these uh, connected networks here are not able to learn that. That's what we use another architecture, which is very popular in computer vision, which is the so-called convolutional neural network. No? So the convolutional neural networks are very good at learning uh, the spatial uh, correlations in the data. So basically the patterns that you see in those images uh, to make predictions. And now there are much better architectures than the convolutional networks uh, for computer vision, but these are kind of like the first ones, and they're still quite powerful in many, many applications. So we started to use this type of application uh, for making these flow predictions, which again, as I was mentioning, are relevant towards uh, pollution concentration measurements in cities. Okay? So what we want to do is basically use the information at the blue surface, uh, so the information at this wall that we have, to predict what happens above that surface, uh, so at a certain distance above that location. And again, you know, the idea is that uh, if we can do that, then we can extend it to more complicated geometries like urban environments, and we can make more um, physically uh, relevant predictions. Okay? So this is a <coughs> convolutional neural network, a schematic representation of a convolutional neural network. Again, I mean, I will not get into too many details because it's not the purpose of the talk, but the idea is that you can have some inputs here. You can measure several quantities yeah, in those planes at the wall. And here is the output. So the output it will be basically the flow velocity that you want to predict at a certain distance above the, the wall. And the, what we do is that in between, we have a number of, um, of uh, so-called hidden layers. So these are part of the architecture of the network. And what we are doing is that we are doing convolution operations. So essentially, we are able to uh, exploit and identify and exploit those features in the input data. So basically, these are images, yeah, pictures, and we are finding patterns that could be edges, lines, circles, simple shapes that are in those uh, images to be able to, uh, after several com concatenation operations of convolution, make up the more complicated uh, elements that are present in the flow, in the real flow that you want to predict. <clears throat> so these are some, some details about how to uh, define those parameters, right? And uh, one important thing is that as you go deeper into the network, uh, and that, that's why neural networks work so well to model physical systems, uh, neural networks learn in a hierarchical manner, right? So the first layers, the first boxes that you see here, are looking at very simple elements in the images, these lines and circles that I was mentioning. But because these operations are concatenated, then you are uh, progressively building more and more complicated things. So you go from the most abstract and simplest elements in your images to more complicated features that are present in these flows in cities, like very complicated structures, very complicated organizations. Uh, and that happens hierarchically. So we can actually learn in the first layers the most basic uh, elements and smaller ones, and the last layers will learn the more complicated and larger ones. And one can actually design this architecture so you have a very deep network, so you can actually learn very complicated things, or you have a less deep network but more parameters so you can identify more types of, uh, of features in your images. Uh, one important thing on how to use these models, how to use these networks, is uh, whether you want to have a global or a local output. Okay? So if you have a case where you have an image, like this one, and you want to classify what is this, if this is a car or a lion or a cat, right? uh, then what you will have is a convolutional neural network, which is you know, doing convolution operations, and at the end, you will have a connected layer. So at the end of the day, your output will be just one label, eh? one, one, uh, one word in this case. No? This is a cat, this is a car, this is a lion. But uh, what we want to do, because if we have all these measurements and we want to get all the predictions above the wall, what we want is a local output. We want to have a flow and temperature and pollution measurement at each location, right? So to do that, it's not enough to say this is a car. We want to have a local output. We want for each point one different prediction. And what we have then is what is called a fully convolutional network. So we are having convolutions all the way. We are having an image here, and in each of the layers we're applying those convolutions to get an image at the output. No? So we have, at the end of the day, another image that tells me how those pollution levels are actually changing. And what that gives me, instead of telling you, okay, this is a car, in this example, you will have this image, 
and each point is going to have a different uh, output. No? So this is the pedestrian cross, this is the street, this is a car, this is a building. Right? So you have a lo local output. You have much more detailed uh, information when you make those predictions. And then, uh, but this is a bit of the summary eh, of how we are doing it. Uh, if someone is interested in fluid mechanics, this is published in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics last year. So we use three quantities measured at the wall, basically the friction of the air at the wall and the pressure of the air at the wall. And we're measuring the flow velocity in three directions. We're measuring the velocity in this direction, we're measuring the vertical velocity and the cross velocity. Right? So we are measuring three quantities at the wall and we are predicting what happens above the wall in three different directions. And uh, I will not go too much into it. We do it also with uh, model decompositions. But perhaps the, the most important thing is that uh, the third row is the, the reference. So this is how the flow looks like. And you can actually see that there is some structure in it, right? There is some Patterns. These are the patterns that I want to identify with my images and that I want to predict. So I want to start with my convolutional network uh, being able to build, oops, to build all these complicated patterns here. So the flow is very chaotic, it's very uh, randomly moving. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to understand, but the network is understanding those patterns present in the data. Right? And the first column is a prediction that is very close to the wall, right here. The second column is a prediction that is farther away. So it's going to be easier to predict when it's closer than when it's farther away. Uh, long story short, the first row is a prediction from a linear method, which basically, uh, as I mentioned some minutes ago, is not so good, right? Because the linear methods uh, are not able to account for the complexity that happens in all these flow cases. So what we need to, to do is to use neural networks that can account for the non-linearities that are present in these flows. And uh, close to the wall, what we get is that the neural network has an almost perfect prediction of the flow. Far away from the wall, one needs to do some tricks with uh, model decomposition, encapsulating the information, and then the, um, the predictions are not as good, but are still quite reasonable. So that's also something that we see statistically. Close to the wall, we get less than 1% error in the flow predictions, which means that if I want to get an idea of what the flow looks like in an urban environment, we can actually get it with quite some accuracy. Um, this is what I was mentioning before about transfer learning, which is also important. I will not bore you with the details, but essentially uh, we can take information from one case and transfer the weights of that case to another one so that we can actually have a more robust prediction. And what it enables us is to reduce the amount of training data by a factor of four. So if suddenly we need to train four times less, then we're having something that is much more sustainable and much more robust, right? So this is quite important. This uh, transfer learning, to me, is, it should be a must in anyone who is using uh, deep learning predictions, deep learning applications for anything that has to do with uh, data. And, and, and especially if you're using large models, you need to use transfer learning. Otherwise, you shouldn't be allowed to use any large GPU machine to train, uh, to train deep learning in the course. So this is very important. And uh, I'm about uh, to reach to the end because I don't want to get too much into the technical side. But this is another interesting uh, architecture. I was telling you that uh, convolutional networks are very good at predicting images. But there is something that is quite um, uh, recently recent and quite uh, interesting, which is what we call the Generative Adversarial Networks, GATS. <coughs> And these are actually quite interesting networks because um, they are, let's say, more powerful for computer vision, although they require quite some data to be, to be trained. And what you can see is that these networks have two parts. One part uh, is what we call the generator, and the other part of this network is what we call the discriminator. And they have um, opposing tasks. So the generator, and a very common application of this is for super resolution, so to take a coarse image and make it much finer. Uh, the generator, what it's doing is that it's producing very accurate high resolution images and the discriminator has the task of identifying whether a certain image is real or it has been produced by this generator. So it has been artificially manufactured. 
and uh, they are trained together against each other using game theory. So both networks or both parts of the network are getting much better at their own task. So the generator is becoming better at fooling the discriminator and the discriminator is getting better at catching the, the, the thief, no? catching what is the, the fake one. So at the end of the day, we're able to produce very accurate high resolution images from low resolution images. And the reason to do it is that in reality, when we are having those black sensors that I was telling you before, we only have a few of them, right? We cannot have infinite amount of sensors. So our inputs are going to look like this. Not like this, which is the, the, the simulation data that I have been using, but more like this, a bunch of um, sparse sensors here and there. Uh, if we compare the prediction, which is the second row, with the reference, what we see is that, of course, the fewer the amount of sensors, the worse the predictions. But what is interesting is that all, always these red and blue strips that I see in the prediction, they are at the same locations as in the reference. So I'm finding where the patterns are. Uh, and I'm also able to find their sizes and their spacing. So I'm, I'm very good at identifying uh, features that are physical. These images look very physical. Even if the input is a mess, right? The input is just a bunch of colors here and there. It's very difficult to really understand anything from this input. But with these uh, generative uh, models, we're able to get very good physical representations of the, of the data. And this is, uh, this is where we are. We're actually trying to uh, use this technology to uh, deploy it. And we're actually proving it in, in urban environments, uh, so in simulation environments with buildings and things like that. So we can actually go from very few sparse measurements to very good representations of the flow and also of the temperature and the pollution levels in a certain environment. Okay. Uh, these are some future applications which we are looking at in the context of fluid mechanics. And these are my, my conclusions. Uh, so basically, takeaway messages. We have 79% of the targets being positively affected by AI, but we should never forget the negative effects because those are important and we can have quite negative consequences. Uh, we have shown that uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, are very helpful for reconstructions in flows, for example, in urban environments. This can have a very important effect in the context of sustainable cities. Uh, we can get actually quite high uh, accuracy here. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, here is my contact information. So this is my email, my web, my social media. So if you have any questions or you want to discuss something or you want to collaborate, something like that, just uh, feel free to, to contact me. And uh, I will now take your questions. Thank you very much. The question is, uh, in the first part of the presentation, you discussed uh, the sustainability goals. And I wanted to ask, like, can you model the attitude of society in achieving those goals, like the poverty thing okay. and the corona apps you discussed? Because some societies are really proper and they like to follow the rules, and some societies, they're like, just laid back and they don't take things really <coughs> serious. So can you model those? into your neural networks? Well, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, of course, modeling uh, behavior uh, of societies is, um, is very difficult. And that's why, uh, that's why you know, the financial models used in deep learning, I mean, there are many challenges associated with them because people are mm, doing unexpected things, right? And, and usually these models assume that people do what is best for them, and that's not usually the case, right? So it's very difficult to model human behavior. But we have a study, which we are now finalizing, where what we did was to analyze using uh, deep learning, so usually transformers and using uh, embeddings, uh, the sentiment uh, of the people towards uh, different SDGs. So we took a bunch of Twitter data from different nationalities. We, classi we took a network uh, that was able to classify the sentiment, so the positive or negative um, reaction towards the development of certain SDGs. And then we classified those by geographical regions, by uh, cultural area, by locations. Uh, and there are quite some interesting uh, conclusions there. So to predict the behavior of people is difficult. But to use amounts, large amounts of data from social media, for example, and to analyze that uh, using, uh, because we have quite some powerful um, 
natural language processing tools now, right, with transformers uh, and, and related uh, deep learning solutions. So that's something that we have done. And uh, what we can do, I mean, Twitter data can be used to some extent as a proxy uh, for how the, the achievement of certain goals uh, is coming along uh, through the sentiment of people. Of course, there are many you know, pitfalls and many limitations of this, but in a way, I think you can get a pretty decent um, assessment of the sentiment of the society by using deep learning to uh, analyze uh, social media data. <clears throat> Other questions? So I have a question on your slide 30, uh, 23, where you talk about explainability. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important area. So it's very nice that we can discuss that a bit more. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, 22, yeah, thank you. So the thing is, you, you have the, the equation, the symbolic equation on the bottom, and as I understood what is, if I understood what you said properly, you said that the neural network outputs the parameters of that equation, is that right? No, no, not exactly. Okay. Uh, I didn't explain it in too, much, in too much detail. So the neural network is trained, uh, and the, the, the beauty of this is that you don't need to have a new neural network to get the equation. You take a network that is already trained, okay? And the network gets these images as input and gets a consumption, you know, a wealth as an output. And the network is there. That's what the network does. What you can do is go into the structure of the network and uh, fit uh, through symbolic regression equations that will connect the inputs and the outputs. So we'll find what are the features of the inputs and we will uh, have an equation that represents the accuracy of the neural network through a symbolic equation. Uh, that was the question, like how it works. Uh, yes. I didn't explain it uh, too much. <clears throat> I can tell you something, this is quite interesting. So in the work by Kramer and others, uh, to tell you that this is not just playing with numbers, I mean, this actually qu works quite well. So they, these people from Princeton, they work with, um, they're astrophysicists, right? So that's what they do. And what they did uh, was to use a neural network to uh, model a very si simple um, particle interaction system, so Newton's second law. And when they did the symbolic regression, they obtained Newton's second law. Okay, congratulations, that was not very difficult. But then they looked at some uh, supernova interaction, I'm not an expert in astrophysics, but it was like some supernova interaction data, uh, which was very complex. They had a network that was able to predict that phenomenon, and then they obtained a symbolic equation, which turned out to be a new physics equation. So they developed new physics through, this is purely data-driven science, right? Because based on the data, you have no idea how to model that with an equation, but then you get an equation from your machine learning model and that equation becomes new physics. So they were able to model uh, supernova interactions through a new equation that now is part of physics, so it's, a, it's a valid model, uh, purely based on data, which is, a, I think, a new paradigm of how we can use uh, uh, data for science development. So this, uh, this is just to tell you that this um, symbolic regression from the network is something that works and in some cases generalizes even better than the network itself. So it's actually something that is quite, uh, it's at the infancy because we are only starting to do this type of things, but it's quite, uh, quite powerful, I think. <clears throat> Good. Thank you. Um, I had a question uh, about, so at some point you showed us uh, the positive and negative impacts of AI on some SDGs. Mm -hmm. And for say quality education, SDG4, you've got 100% uh, for the positive impact on SDG4 and 70% for the negative impact. So I don't really understand how that's possible. How do you compute these percentages? Yeah, so what we did, was, uh, so this is one SDG, right? And for that SDG, you have many targets. So for one particular target, AI can have positive, negative, or both, right? You can have for the same target, both positive and negative effects. Uh, I mean, for uh, one, one simple example, let's imagine that you are having, um, you know, you're using AI to try to preserve a certain, uh, a certain uh, this is for life under the water, no? So a certain, uh, like the, the 
certain species of, of fish you know, in a certain area. And then you're identifying what, with the AI and the data analysis what are the predators of this fish, and we are able to find measures and you, you change things around so you can actually preserve this fish very efficiently. But at the same time, you're disrupting the system, you're disrupting the, the ecosystem where this fish is actually living, and you're creating a lot of harm in many other species, right? So that's one example of how AI can help achieve certain goals because you are certainly helping a certain species that is maybe endangered, but that you're maybe putting other species or other uh, plants uh, in danger. And maybe even by that action, you are affecting fish that are uh, you know, taken by some fishermen in uh, Southeast Asia, so you're having negative effects in poverty in that area, right? So every action may have unintended uh, negative effects associated with the positive effects. That's why if you look at a particular SDG, uh, like SDG 4, you can have many positive effects from AI, but you can also have, uh, as a consequence of those actions, many, many negative effects as well that one should at least be aware of. Uh, so that maybe, maybe it turns out by doing this uh, exercise that your solution is to have a broader uh, context of, um, of variables into account when making the optimization. When you're making an optimization, which is the thing that AI basically does, you have a certain amount of variables and you get the maximum reward uh, based on those variables. But maybe you should extend those variables, right? And maybe in the context of uh, SDG4, you should have more social um, variables that you're not considering. And by, you know, the, the AI is reproducing what we are, you know, programming it to do, essentially. So we may actually harm many other things if we are not aware of the context in which that application is actually being deployed. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in the uh, your sparse sensing framework, how do you decide the number and position of, uh, of the sensors? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. So in this uh, example that I'm showing uh, here, this was just a proof of concept of how to, how to um, use this super resolution task. So we are just taking the original data and reducing the resolution. So in this case, we're not selecting where those things are. But we are now developing several strategies to, uh, to find the, the sensor optimization. And uh, I mean, one strategy, one interesting approach to this is uh, based on what we call explainable AI, which is not interpretable. Explainability, it turns out to be something different from uh, interpretability. So in explainable AI, uh, like um, saliency maps, for example, what you do is that you see for each uh, pixel of your input or for each feature of your input, what is the importance of that region to make a prediction? And then what you can do is say, okay, I only have 10 sensors. I mean, I, don't, I cannot do all of this, I only have 10. So then you would put your sensors in the regions where the, you know, the, the input data influences the most the output. And then you can maximize uh, that way the, the accuracy of the prediction. So that's one way that it seems to be working quite, quite well. So that's something that we're exploring. Of course, you can also do more classical optimization. Uh, methods. And um, also we are exploring some uh, approaches based on autoencoders to be able to, uh, because autoencoders allow you to compress the data. So by analyzing the autoencoder you can actually see in that compressed um, state of the, of the system how certain variables and how certain sensors are affecting that. So that's another direction where one can actually uh, look at the sensor optimization as well. Um, and also, I, I see that uh, you're basically projecting to a, a POD basis, I guess, from the image. Um, did you try to use uh, different bases like DMD or spectral decomposition? So that's, uh, that's another good question. I didn't, because I wasn't so sure of the background, so I didn't want to go too technical into the details. But so this is what we call the FCM POD, right? Uh, we took POD because it's, it's fast and it's easy. Uh, and, and it has one advantage, because the POD, we do it in, in this tessellated uh, domain. So we take in this, each of these subdomains, we do the POD, right? And what happens in these small subdomains is that all the, uh, all the um, scales that are larger than the domain, they all get lumped into the first mode. 
So actually with few modes, <laughs> we can get a good uh, prediction. Uh, the, the disadvantage of it is that uh, you need to have, you need to play a little bit with the number of subdomains that you have to avoid discontinuities of the reconstruction in the full domain. However, something that we have started to do is to replace the POD. This is not, um, we are working on it, so it's not really uh, published or anything, but we're doing the, replacing the POD with autoencoders. So we are trying to get a more um, compact, uh, low order representation of the system through autoencoders and then predict the temporal dynamics of very few modes. Uh, actually, with autoencoders, we have quite some work uh, applicable to, um, to flows like, uh, like the turbulent urban environment that I showed before, so very complex turbulent flows, where you can uh, get with 10 modes, you get 90% of the energy and you can uh, impose orthogonality of those autoencoder modes. So we have been able to get orthogonal uh, ranked, so hierarchical, autoencoder modes, and with 10 modes we can reconstruct 90, more than 90% of the, of the energy. So one of the directions where we're going for this prediction framework is to use the autoencoder based uh, low order model and to make the predictions on, on that. That's Thank still you. ongoing work, but I think it's promising. <clears throat> Uh, I'm curious about uh, how is transfer learning done in practice? Like, yeah. is it um, just that you, for instance, train the weights and biases <clears throat> on one model and mm -hmm. then you initialize the weights and biases in the same way? There are two examples. Uh, so I skipped these slides because I didn't, I wasn't sure if that was interesting for, the, for this audience, but I realize now that it's interesting, at least for you. So I have two examples of transfer learning. Um, one is, um, so this is basically for one Reynolds number, so one flow case. Uh, I have two models, one where I want to predict close to the wall, and another one where I want to predict far away from the wall. Okay? So what I, you know, the, the hypothesis here is that um, the first layers, uh, they identify features that are simpler and typically smaller, right? Uh, because the receptive field uh, gets you know, bigger as you go deeper into the network. And then the last layers uh, are identifying features that are bigger, right? Mm -hmm. So between the information close and far away from the wall, the hypothesis is that the small features are very similar and the larger ones are the ones that are more different. Right? Mm -hmm. So the way that we do transfer learning here is that we take the network from the Y plus 15, so close to the wall, we freeze the three first layers because those are the ones that are in principle identifying smaller things and we only train the three last ones mm -hmm. to predict that farther away from the wall okay. at Y plus 30. And doing it like that, what we do is that we reduce the training time to 23% of the original. So more than a you know, factor of four reduction, because of course you're only training this, and uh, this one is similar enough in the two, in the two cases. Mm -hmm. So as one example, you just transfer, the, you can freeze some layers and only train part of the network, and the other half is kind of uh, you know, taken from a previous example. In this example, what we do uh, is that we go from a low to a high Reynolds number. So we have a less turbulent case and a more turbulent case. And what we do is that we transfer the weights of the low Reynolds number to make predictions in the high Reynolds number case, so the not so turbulent case to the more turbulent case, and then we initialize the training from the weights of the low Reynolds number. Okay. And by doing that, and we did some comparisons, reducing the amount of data and so on. By initializing the training from the other case, then we reduce the amount of training data to 25% of the original, mm -hmm. so to a factor of four. And why is this interesting? Well, first of all, because you train less, right? So you use less resources in training the network. But more importantly, because the data generation is important. I mean, this simulation is almost two orders of magnitude more expensive than this one. So if you can do most of the training in a very cheap case and then the additional training that you need to do, you reduce it by a factor of four, then the, the uh, cost of this uh, simulation uh, that, that makes the whole process much cheaper computationally and much more responsible uh, environmentally. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's basically the idea. You can either transfer the weights and initialize a new training with the transfer weights, or you can freeze some layers, depending on the physics of your problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> <coughs> I hit uh, 10,000 steps earlier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my second question is actually related to the first one. 
So um, <coughs> when we have all this data, I wondered uh, how can we uh, efficiently use, uh, so I, I'm talking about the SDGs again. So uh, how can we efficiently use these percentages uh, for yeah. each SDG, meaning, so if, got, if, we, if we've got an AI which mm -hmm. would like to help us make decisions, <coughs> how can this AI determine uh, which SDGs are more important than others? So yeah. how should we introduce biases? <coughs> and f well, for that, maybe to determine that, we could uh, try simulating uh, the effect of uh, choosing a bias for each SDG. But in such a complex system, I mean, we're talking about the whole world, basically. So how can we assess which... SDGs are more important than others? Yeah, that's an excellent question. <clears throat> so I hinted to the fact that we are doing this now with uh, natural language processing. So we want to make this process automatic, right? To avoid the biases of basically obtaining this, this data. We, we actually are starting the project. Well, we have some initial results, but uh, the main goal of that project is not to redo this with uh, AI, is to use uh, an AI-based framework for policy and decision making. Okay. So how would you do that? Well, uh, in practice, what you can do is to make a matrix, right? So you have uh, all the SDGs versus all the SDGs, and then you can you know, confront them with each other. So you can see what are the mutual synergies and the mutual trade-offs, right? Uh, so with that matrix, which is basically an extension of this data set, the next step is to, is to do optimization on, on that matrix. Uh, so basically, if you want to maximize the return on climate, uh, I am part of the KTH Climate Action Center, so we have quite some focus on climate. But of course, climate may have very negative effects on other SDGs, right? I mean, so, so we want to maximize the um, positive outcome of climate while minimizing any uh, negative effects and also taking any synergies, right? I, I mean, SDG 13 and 7 have quite some synergies. So, so we want to be able to exploit those synergies that are not so obvious, right, through the data. And then uh, having that matrix and saying, okay, we have this amount of uh, resources, money yeah, to invest, to maximize the return on SDG 13, what should be the decisions, the steps to be taken? And then using that matrix, we can try to see what should be the steps where we should uh, do that um, optimization. And that can be done in two ways. That can be done statically, right? So you just have the matrix and you just get the maximum and that's it. Uh, which is with any gradient descent optimization, you can, you can do it. But a more interesting scenario is when the situation is changing over time, right? Because when you change something in SDG 13, then suddenly everything else changes, right? You don't keep everything as static. And for that um, type of optimization, we are planning on using uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, so reinforcement learning uh, in which an agent is interacting with this dynamical system that is changing over time and we can maximize the return over a certain time horizon. Uh, so basically, to kind of summarize a bit uh, the, the, the question that you had, uh, it's about making this data automatic, that's step number one. It's about making that matrix of interactions of positives and negatives among SDGs, step number two. And step number three is to do the optimization either statically or dynamically over time. But so what I don't get is, so if we, what you do here, if I, if I if I understand it well, is try um, decide how to allocate, say, budget by looking uh, at, the, at, the, at the means of optimizing uh, synergies and the number of SDGs impacted. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, you basically assume that at first uh, all the SDGs have a similar weight. Well, uh, that depends a bit on your on your reward. Right? I mean, if you want to have um, the maximum return on a certain SDG, I mean, that will have the maximum weight, of course. And, uh, and of course, uh, you may want to prioritize others and have, give less weight to, to, to others. So that's a little bit of a design choice uh, on how you want to do the optimization. You can give all of them the same weight as well. So it depends a little bit on how you want to do it. But of course, um, that's a hyperparameter of the problem, which to some extent is a political hyperparameter. No? Well, that's actually related to my, my, my next yeah. question is, you, you talked about policy and decision making and uh, uh, AI could help with that. But the, pro the problem here is that uh, AI evolves very quickly and it feels like uh, policies and uh, regulations don't follow. Yeah. And so even though they say they, they catch up and they... they uh, no, they don't. They, 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 I mean, they've got this a, is... a, a miraculous update. Well, in a year or two, it won't be valid anymore. So how do we cope with that? 
Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that's of course a valid question and, and I think uh, many, many people are working on it uh, and trying to tackle those challenges. I think that an essential aspect of it is this one, is interpretability. So whatever you're doing with your models and whatever the um, technology is pushing forward, you should be able to open the hood and get an equation like this to understand what the model is doing. I think that, uh, I mean, of course, we should go into regulations. It's a delicate balance because you don't want to over-regulate either, right? Uh, if you regulate AI as a whole, the problem is that you might have a too strict um, uh, policy to, uh, that would harm the, the research, right? Because you are not allowing you know, people to investigate anything. And if you go too narrow into co concrete applications, the technology evolves so fast that the regulations are outdated very soon. So it's a bit of a challenging um, balance there between the generality and the concrete uh, examples that you want to regulate. But I think that uh, in that dance, uh, a key aspect is this one, is interpretability. And of course, this comes, it's not only about being able to open the hood and see what's inside, it's also about uh, accountability and responsibility of the, of the um, officers and the agents that are you know, deploying these this, uh, systems. So it's not only that your method is interpretable, it has to do also with openness of data, it has to do with openness of the code, that everything is open source and people can know what is being used in these methods. Uh, and then, of course, technology goes very fast, we should have people who are experts who are, in a way, being able to understand those changes and integrate those into meaningful policy, but keeping that everything should be, should be open and, and transparent and interpretable. I think, I mean, again, it's not uh, an easy answer, right, because this is a challenge that we are uh, looking at right now. But I think that these are some of the keys that can help with this challenge. Thank you. <clears throat> Question? I actually have a question. I get to make uh, transfer learning with my neural network. So in the sense that I, I was present in a meeting on, um, there was a meeting of, uh, on Saturday and there was a mathematician talking about complex systems. Uh, so I get to reuse the same question I, I gave there. <laughs> Transfer learning sounds, per sounds perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that I, but he's a mathematician, so I want to see the perspective of an engineer. Yeah. Um, uh, so, oh, there is this uh, famous quote from uh, uh, Feynman uh, about uh, complex systems that we have uh, um, our minds, because they are simple, have uh, <coughs> separated the old world into uh, disciplines, uh, biology, chemistry, mathematics, physics, uh, and so on. But in the end, this is all a uh, whole glass of wine. It's, uh, it's always the same thing, right? And uh, so I wonder, what is your take on uh, how AI can actually help deal with very complex problems. And a little bit going to what Sabri was saying, what, uh, what challenge will arise when we understand that two, SDG, for instance, two very important objectives are in contrast, in contrast with each other, but really in contrast? Yeah, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the, of the key challenges, of course. That's, uh, and it, one of the motivations why we started uh, this project on doing this uh, automatically with machine learning is that when you see people from the, from the UN, for example, or from the International Science Council talking about sustainability, they always make these connections between SDGs that are very obvious, right? The things that uh, if you help uh, uh, life under the, under the sea, you may be helping also life over the sea. Yeah, well, sure, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so what we want to do is really understand those hidden connections, not those hidden synergies. And that's where perhaps having this vast amount of data making this optimization over all of them, we can really, really find those hidden connections. And it is true, I mean, we work with disciplines. Uh, I was yesterday in a meeting in the um, uh, KTX uh, Climate Action Center on how to be able to harness all the knowledge that we have towards climate, no? because it, we are kind of in a rush here, right? And how many disciplines are, you know, we have knowledge from many disciplines that people might not even understand, like very fundamental mathematicians may have great tools to make optimization that is going to help to achieve those, those climate uh, goals. But our minds don't really work like that. No? Our human primate-based minds are not working. They work in silos, right? We really are very used to separate and find patterns and so on. And the solutions to tackle this complex uh, challenge that we have ahead, it has to be uh, global. It has to be really getting everybody in all the different perspectives. And I think that uh, AI can help because in principle, you can get a bit of an unbiased view of how different disciplines can really contribute to, to, to these big challenges. 
uh, that might go beyond what we can see in a more limited um, approach. Um, so I think uh, from the perspective of whether we should be doing it, I think AI can give a path forward to, to do it. Uh, whether AI can tackle this, whether AI can really get the information from these very different um, disciplines, that's a bit more difficult to, to, to see. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends a bit, uh, and I guess there will be a big influence on how the data that is being used to train these models, how biased it is itself, right? If the data is already having some footprints of different disciplines in there, then probably the outcome will reflect those. So I think we have to <clears throat> make a big effort in taking a holistic view first in the data that we're using uh, so that hopefully our outcomes will be more general. Uh, yeah, so you're speaking about AI on a global level, but climate policy is often on a federal level and even on a state level in the United States. How can you take into account that fact when calculating like the matrix for the when SDGs? When calculating what? Uh, climate policy. Yeah, uh, no, that's another good question. I mean, in the end, um, this is uh, at a quite uh, large level because these SDGs are global, right? And uh, something that... Uh, I mean, if this framework is then going to be used for real uh, policy uh, deployment, then of course one needs to engage a number of stakeholders that are uh, at different levels, at the European level and then at a the local level as well. Uh, because, uh, I mean, this type of framework will tell you you should invest in these targets from this uh, SDG and you should avoid these targets, right? But then of course to go from target to actual uh, actions that requires much more, much more local uh, actions. And some of the extensions of this have to do with, um, with projects, so how certain targets of the SDGs are connected to concrete projects, which could be something that one extends beyond this framework. Uh, and also we come into the question of the, of the indicators, right? I mean, we have the goals, the targets, and then the indicators, uh, which what we are also realizing is that uh, the current framework of indicators might be even a bit too limited for uh, you know, some of the AI uh, possibilities that we have and there is quite some uh, debate around having a, a new SDG on uh, you know uh, technology and data and having concrete indicators to be able to uh, account for the possibilities of this technology but that's a little bit uh, in the air at the moment I guess the best way forward is to uh, you need to make a a boundary, a free body diagram, where you set your boundaries, and your boundaries, probably the targets, the CG targets is a good starting point, then how you turn, turn that into concrete actions will depend on projects, will depend on uh, local and, and more national governments, and how you're able to engage with, with those, uh, which is not easy either. But I think that, in a way, being able to raise awareness, being able to, um, we have quite some contact with the city of Stockholm, for example. I mean, they, they are quite good at, uh, we are lucky that they are interested in technology, they're interested in, uh, in these type of solutions, so we have a good communication with them. Uh, we had people from the Swedish Parliament at the university last week as well, so, so I mean, they are aware of some of the things that we are doing. Uh, and I think that for us as researchers, if we want to make an impact in this area, that's part of our job. We need to reach out, we need to be able to engage with, uh, with the government, uh, because otherwise this will be a very nice paper somewhere, but it will not become anything that will help us, right? So I think that we really need to push in that, in that direction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> very good question. Uh, I have a semi-technical question. Yep. Uh, uh, what I mean is that uh, you have talked about um, different network structures, infra uh, architecture, and so on. And um, there is a little bit in the, in the community, there is excitement for uh, uh, machine learning. Sometimes there is a little bit of a fear that uh, uh, results are not generalizable enough or <coughs> transferable. I mean, you talked about transferability. I think it's, it's very important. So uh, how, from a, let's say, a scientific and ethical point of view, can we make sure that uh, we get reprodu reproducible results. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this applies to fluid dynamics, combustion, <coughs> but every, uh, Everything. every other field. I mean, I think it's, it's, so there are two things. One is the reproducibility, and the other thing is the generalizability, right? And with reproducibility, <coughs> I think that, uh, and now more journals are going in that direction, that every paper with uh, machine learning uh, methods should include the code and the data, 
I mean, that, that should be open source, uh, that everybody can get in, can try to reproduce your results. Every paper of us that we have published, we have that, uh, both the code and the results, and we have had people uh, trying to reproduce the results. Oh, I don't get the same results, but have you really put these parameters? We said, no, you didn't. Okay, now, now you get the same results. So that, that's very important, to be able to have everything open access. I think PRF, Physical Review Fluids, they had this open letter with Kumosakos and company uh, kind of uh, saying that this was a requirement. No? And I think it should, not only for machine learning studies, it should be for experimental studies and it should be for numerical studies, which hasn't really been the case over the years, but I think now we should do it. So if we publish the codes and we publish the data, we should really be able to have that um, reproducibility, at least. The generalizability is a more important, well, not more important, but more difficult, perhaps, uh, problem. And I think that, uh, I mean, if we want things to be really, truly general, uh, one can go in the direction of um, transfer learning, which helps in that. Um, of course, interpretability is also helping because then you see the equations and perhaps you can. But then the other area which I didn't touch upon today is then physics informed neural networks well, or physics guided because there are different flavors to it. Uh, and perhaps adding more physics into these models can help to also make it a bit more, more general. Uh, I mean, in general, if you are modeling, I mean, we know that this. Uh, turbulent flow predictions, they have a linear and a nonlinear part, right? And the linear part is easy to, to predict because we know it. So perhaps what you should do is just, for whatever you know the physics, you apply the physical model, uh, and for whatever you don't know, that's when you bring in the deep learning model, and that can also help generalize, right? Because that linear part may actually help you to, shape, to, to change shape and geometry, and the nonlinear part then with transfer learning, one can save a bit of training. So I think it goes in that direction. Uh, but of course, uh, I guess, um, yeah, it's a bit, um, we're starting with this somehow. Uh, it's good, as you say, that there is some uh, interest in the community. I think there is also some reluctance from some, uh, uh, from some people, which I think is healthy and is very good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, general stability, I think one should be going in that, in that direction, probably. I think it's really uh, interesting, these models. Uh, you, I think you <coughs> want to into that, these models where you have a, a part that you know and then you yeah. You re reserve, let's say, the, uh, uh, the machine learning part into a correction. Yeah, kind exactly. Of term. Something yeah. like that. Exactly. So yeah. the linear part that you know, you apply the model. The nonlinear part is where you, what you don't know is when you use the machine learning. And then hopefully you can do interpretability and learn something about the yeah, nonlinear part. Exactly. Um, and then, of course, uh, physics informed neural networks, which are heavily based on the equations in the end. So then one can actually have more general generalization uh, possible in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, sir, you have talked about that you are a part of KTH climate change uh, society and everything. <clears throat> so I wanted to ask, like, are you also collaborating or working with countries and the universities over there, the most affected by climate change? Um, like the countries which are not producing a lot of carbon dioxide, but they are affected most by the climate change, like the Himalayan <coughs> communities in Pakistan and India, they are greatly affected by climate change. So are you working with people over there also? They are the most affected <coughs> by it and like for greater impact and like for the betterment of world? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point. <clears throat> I mean, we have uh, just started the center uh, beginning of this year. And we are starting collaborations with different universities, uh, from MIT, for example, we have some contacts and within Europe, uh, and uh, to be able to engage um, uh, different uh, geographical areas and different uh, areas of income as well, it's important. We have some papers also on the data divides, looking at the income, looking at different countries and different uh, geographical regions, and how uh, some of the issues associated with AI can affect most dramatically areas with, with lowest income, essentially. So that's, um, of course, we're aware of it, it's important, uh, and we are also trying and working towards having more uh, engagement with, with uh, different uh, areas. Yeah, it's, it's very important, absolutely. I've got a question uh, related to Professor Parentes. He talked about uh, reproducibility, so how can you guarantee that? Mm -hmm. Other than that, the fact that we use a black box, uh, so w when it's only about, say, f uh, fluid mechanics and uh, uh, trying to uh, 
to, uh, to extrapolate, say, uh, features of a flow, then yeah, if, if they're not entirely right, it's not, uh, the, the effects, the, the consequences are not, say, catastrophic. But if we, do, say, uh, if we talk about, say, uh, robots, uh, which we are, to, to, to whom we try to give some sort of conscience, uh, then how, how can we cope with the fact that we, we, we're dealing with a black box, so we don't really know how it, can, how it will react in very uh, different circumstances. We, we can't, we can't uh, test its, its, uh, its reaction to uh, any possible uh, circumstance. Uh, that's impossible. So. How do we do that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, interpretability. You can't have any application with a real impact in our society that is not interpretable. You cannot have black boxes. That's not, uh, that should not be a possibility. So, of course, I mean, and conscience, I mean, that's also maybe something that is a bit uh, unclear and, well, it, we are not there and it's not really clear how to get there or whether we should get there, right? Um, if we think of, of robots as, uh, you know, algorithms uh, that are making certain tasks, uh, which is maybe the, what we can expect in the midterm, right? Then this is the direction. <clears throat> then one should really go to interpretable solutions. Uh, there, there is this example uh, on, um, um, I think it was a, a liver diagnosis um, software by IBM, where I think it was called Stream, where they, they had a deep learning model, which was very accurate. Uh, and it was not interpretable. <clears throat> and then they had a decision tree model, which was interpretable because decision trees, are, uh, you can really see how the decision process has been taken. And um, that was interpretable, of course, but it was less accurate, much less accurate than the deep learning model. And uh, the one that got adopted was the decision tree because it's a medical application where you can have interpretability. What I'm trying to say is that um, deep learning models, I mean, they are more accurate because they are designed to exploit more data and to be able to have much more flexible architectures. It's normal that they're more accurate, but you should have that interpretability. So going in this direction where we can really see what is inside that black box is essential. And if you cannot do it, if you cannot have an application that is interpretable, then use a simpler model that is interpretable because that's preferable. You should not have any data-driven solution in an application yeah, that is having an impact on, on anyone's uh, lives, that is not that is a black box. That should not be possible. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> is there any other question? If there is no other question, I think the discussion was very lively, and I thank you for that. And uh, I would like to thank Professor Vinueza again thank for you. coming here. And for the very nice talk. Thank you very much for the discussion. I think this was very, very interesting. I had very, very yeah. good questions. And, very, <laughs> and, and I think that this is what makes it uh, interesting, you know, that we can really have this back and forth and, and, and deep, that deeper into these things. So thank you for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.